Hi, everyone. Today we have Emma as our speaker. She's a second year PhD from UC Berkeley. Today, she's going to talk about her work, Dari, in encrypted search system with distributed trust. Let's welcome her. Thank you. Um, okay, cool. Um, so I'll, I'll go ahead and start. Um, so feel free also, um, the way that I have my uh, set up with like the um, with the screen sharing, it's a little bit hard to see the chat during the, the talk. So feel free to interrupt with any questions. Um, and I, I might not be able to see the chat until afterwards. Um, yeah, so thank you so much for having me. Um, I'm going to be talking about Dory, an encrypted search system with distributed trust. Uh, this work was done with Eric, Ellen, Rilke, and Jan at UC Berkeley, um, and I appeared this last winter at OSDI. So over the last few years, end-to-end -end encrypted systems have grown increasingly popular. And one example of these is end-to-end -end encrypted file systems, like Keybase, Prevail, SpiderOak, Sync, and Trezor. These systems provide strong security guarantees, even if the attacker compromises the server. So the server just stores ciphertext, uh, and the client has the key to decrypt these ciphertexts. So even if the attacker breaks into the server, it can't learn the contents of the documents. Users also expect the ability to search over their documents. So given some keyword Apple, they expect to get back a list of the documents containing that keyword. This is a challenge for end-to-end -end encrypted file systems. Uh, the server can't decrypt the data in order to search over the contents. Uh, so the server just has these ciphertexts that it can't decrypt. Uh, and so if the user wants to find all the documents containing the keyword Apple, um, the server can't perform search in the way uh, that we would usually expect. Uh, so over the past 20 years, researchers have been working on this problem of, of encrypted search. Uh, and existing solutions generally fall into one of two categories. Uh, so on the one hand, there's searchable encryption schemes that are efficient but weak search access patterns. And on the other hand, are ORAM-based solutions that are inefficient but protect search access patterns. Uh, and to understand the trade-off between these two, uh, I want to talk a little bit about what search access patterns are uh, and why we should care about them. Um, so before I dive into search access patterns, I want to contrast them a little bit to the leakage in many end-to-end -end encrypted file systems. Um, so let's say we have an end-to-end -end encrypted file system. Um, the user wants to read some document three. Um, they're going to send a request to the end-to-end -end encrypted file system. Uh, and the file system server will learn that, that the user requested this document three. Um, they don't learn any information about the contents of the document, uh, but they do learn with, uh, the fact that the document is being requested. Um, the concern is that by adding some wiki search system on top of this end-to-end -end encrypted file system, um, an attacker that has compromised the server will be able to learn more information about the actual contents of the documents. Um, so let's say the user is searching for some keyword Apple. Uh, they make a query to the search system. Um, and then they make a bunch more queries over time. Um, the concern is that the attacker will be able to start learning some information at the word level about the contents of the document. Um, so they learn information that they weren't able to just in the encrypted file system setting. Um, so to make this a bit more concrete, I want to consider a simple example of how these search access patterns can be used to recover document plain text. So I'm going to walk through a simple example of a file injection attack. Um, so let's say we have some attacker that's compromised the server. Um, this attacker can also send the user emails that, uh, that the user will then upload into the search index. Um, so the attacker is going to send the user the one word email containing the word flu. Um, the user then uploads this document to the search index. Um, the server then is going to update the row corresponding to flu in the search index. Um, and the attacker then sees that the word flu is associated with row three. So this is just using a simple inverted index structure uh, for the search index where we have you know, ciphertext for the keyword and the ciphertext for the list of documents. Um, you can imagine more complex ones, but it just sort of gives you an idea of how this attack might work. Um, so now we know that the word flu is associated with row three. Um, the attacker can then repeat this for all words in the English dictionary. Um, then at some later point, the user receives some confidential email. Um, the user uploads this confidential email to the search index. Uh, the attacker sees that row three is updated in the search index. So now the attacker knows that the document contains the word flu. This is information that we want to protect. This document should remain encrypted. Um, so this is a real problem for us. Um, so this is a fairly straightforward attack. Um, but there are many more types of attacks leveraging different types of leakage um, on more sophisticated types of search systems, um, even leveraging things like uh, the number of search results that are returned. 
Um, so given the drawbacks of these search access patterns and how dangerous they can be, uh, we might consider an ORAM based solution. So ORAM or Oblivious RAM can allow a client to read and write data at the server and hide access patterns. Um, so which element uh, is being, um, so, so, so the server doesn't learn which element is being read or written to um, at the server. Uh, and, and given ORAM, we can implement search by building a simple inverted index in ORAM. Um, so we have a keyword mapped to a list of documents containing that keyword. Uh, and the advantage of this solution is that the runtime is polylogarithmic in the index size. Um, so this has a uh, good asymptotic complexity. Um, however, the large constants make the cost prohibitive for encrypted file systems. Um, so the problem here is really the cost of updates, because we need to do an ORAM access for every keyword in the document um, to update the list of documents corresponding to each keyword. Um, so this becomes really expensive for this use case. Um, so this is maybe not ideal for our setting. Um, so these existing solutions fall into one of two categories. So searchable encryption, efficient but leaking search access patterns, and ORAM based solutions that are inefficient but protect search access patterns. Uh, and so we introduce Dory, which is both efficient so, and protects. By the way, Emma, um, yeah. I guess I, I wanted to mention there's also a oblivious data structure, so you don't have to use general ORAM. Like th this type of problem is like perfect fit for oblivious data structure, and you, you don't have to incur the ORAM overhead. Yes, yeah, 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 yes, yes, yes. That's a good point. Thank you for yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you for pointing that out. And we're and we're looking at sort of like a different um Dory is sort of using a different a, a different class of techniques, this KR, KR and leveraging uh like non-colluding servers. Um but yeah, yeah, you're yeah, you're totally right about the state structures. Okay. Um so so Dory is going to eliminate the search access pattern linkage. Um, so, so we want to replace this leaky search system that leaks information at the word level of the document um, with Dory, which isn't going to incur any leakage on top of the underlying and then encrypted file system beyond when a search takes place, uh, what documents the search takes place over, um, and, and any side effects as a result of the search. Um, so the user might go um, and access different documents as a result of the search. Um, so to tackle this problem and uh, and, and sort of think about the design of an encrypted search system differently, um, we ask what do real encrypted file systems require from a search system? Uh, and so to answer this question, we surveyed five companies that provide end-to-end -end encrypted file systems. This included uh, Keybase, Prevail, SpiderOak, Sync, and Trezor. And we learned that each wanted server-side search, but didn't have a solution deployed because of concerns about search access patterns um, or performance. Um, so I don't have time to discuss the full quantitative and qualitative findings from our survey. Um, and you can see our paper for, for the uh, latency, cost, uh, and concurrency requirements that we gathered from these companies. Um, but I just want to highlight two key findings. Uh, so the first is that a linear scan for search is acceptable if certain latency and cost requirements are met for expected workloads. Uh, so linear scan is never going to be best for all workloads. Um, maybe it's fine. If the cost of the end user, uh, if the latency that the end user experiences is relatively small uh, for the workloads that we expect. Um, and over this course of the survey, we learned uh, what exactly an expected workload is for these companies. Um, the second finding that's relevant to our design is that distributing trust is acceptable if certain security requirements are met. Um, so I want to unpack a little bit what I mean by distributing trust and what exactly these security requirements are. Um, so by distributing trust, I mean that we want to provide certain security guarantees if an attacker can, can compromise some, but not all trust domains in a system. Um, so these trust domains might be split across clouds, so one in AWS and Azure, um, maybe across different institutions that we assume you know, are, are unlikely to work together, uh, maybe even different countries if we're worried about you know, government subpoenas. Um, but the idea is simply that uh, by, by breaking into one, maybe it's hard to break into the other as well. Uh, and so given distributed trust, uh, these companies had uh, certain requirements about how exactly we could leverage distributed trust in order to make this problem easier. Um, and their first requirement was that if we have at least one honest trust domain, the attacker shouldn't be able to learn the search access patterns. Um, and so here, this means that we shouldn't be able, we shouldn't have to make assumptions about the behavior of the other server. Um, and so we need a malicious rather than a semi-honest uh, threat model. 
The second requirement is if we, that if we don't have any honest trust domains, the attacker shouldn't be able to directly assemble the search index. Um, so in this case, search access patterns aren't protected, um, but we don't want a search index that you know, immediately reveals the contents of these documents. Um, so it'd be the case that over, you know, over the course of time, these search access patterns are able to allow you to learn the contents, um, but, but when you can compromise both servers, you shouldn't be able to immediately learn that. And so this rules out solutions based on secret sharing the contents of the index, for example. Um, so given these requirements, uh, we can start Dory with the fall, uh, you know, so based on the following structure. So we have two Dory servers deployed in different trust domains, um, and each server is going to have a copy of the search index. Uh, and clients will interact directly with these Dory servers. Uh, and the file system can be placed in any of these trust domains. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about the design of Dory. I'm going to start off with a really simple version uh, and slowly discuss the different challenges and fills it up to something that's closer to the version in the paper. Um, so we construct our search index um, as a list of bitmaps um, for each document. Um, so bitmap one is going to be a bitmap corresponding to the keywords in document one. Um, and so given this really straightforward index structure, it's pretty easy to perform updates and searches. Um, so for an update, the client is just going to create a bitmap corresponding to the keywords in that document. Um, the client will send the server this bitmap. Then the server is going to update the bitmap corresponding to that document ID um, in the search index. Um, so updates will just write rows into our search index. Uh, now to search, the client is going to compute the index corresponding to the keyword. Um, it's going to send the index to the server. Um, now the client is going to respond with the corresponding column. Uh, and then the client will output the row numbers where the column value is 1. Um, so just all the places uh, where, where the bit is set to one. Uh, and this is the advantage that we're not actually leaking the number of results that are being returned as well. Uh, so our updates are writing rows um, and our searches are retrieving columns. And so in this way, we're taking advantage of uh, both dimensions of our search index. Uh, so this is a really, a really simplified version of our solution. Uh, and so one very obvious drawback is that we're not actually protecting search access patterns. Um, so the attacker learns which column is requested, which is going to leak information about the keyword being searched for. Um, so we'd like to hide this information. Uh, and so to do this, uh, we leverage distributed point functions um, or DPFs, which are going to allow us to solve the problem of uh, private information retrieval or PIR. Um, so we're going to use these DPFs um, to allow us to leverage multiple servers to hide which element the user is retrieving. So let's say uh, these two servers have identical copies of this array. Um, and the user wants to retrieve one of the elements from this array. Um, these DPFs are going to give us the property that if at least one of the servers is honest, the attacker can't learn the index being requested. Um, this does require a linear scan over the entire array, um, but these DPFs are pretty fast to evaluate in practice because they just require a uh, AES, implement uh, AES evaluations, which can be performed efficiently in hardware. Um, so let's say uh, the user wants to retrieve element A2. Um, it's going to generate DPF keys that it sends to both servers. Um, both servers will use the DPF keys to um, evaluate on each of the elements in the array. Um, they'll send back responses, and from those, uh, the client can assemble the original element A2. So this is a really high-level overview of how these work, omitting a lot of, a, a lot of details, um, but hopefully this just gives you a sense for the functionality that these provide um, and how we can then leverage this in Dory. Um, so now we can leverage these DPFs in order to hide which column we're retrieving in Dory. Um, so instead of having just one server storing this index, we're now going to store identical copies of the index uh, at different servers. And this is going to give us the property that if at least one of these trust domains is honest, then Dory is going to hide search access patterns. Um, so the client, as before, is going to get the index corresponding to the keyword. Uh, it's then going to generate DPF keys for this index. Um, and each server is going to evaluate the DPF keys on each of the columns uh, in the search index. Um, the servers will send back responses. Uh, from this, the client can assemble the original column uh, and then output all the places uh, where, the, where the column is set to one, as before. So the second challenge that I want to talk about is how we compress the search index. Uh, so having a bitmap for every keyword in the English dictionary means that the search index becomes really large. Uh, and this is a problem because we have to perform a linear scan over the entire search index in order to do a search. Uh, so this linear scan is going to take a long time if the search index is large. 
Uh, so in order to compress the spit map, uh, we use bloom filters. Uh, so just as a quick reminder, bloom filters allow us to provide efficient membership testing. Um, so if the contents of the document uh, are the keywords apple and orange, um, we'll just hash the word apple to different locations in our bloom filter, set them to one, uh, and the same for orange. And now if we want to check if a keyword is contained uh, in our bloom filter, we'll hash the keyword uh, to both the locations and check if they're both set to one. Uh, and this is the advantage that it preserves search column alignment. So instead of retrieving one column corresponding to the keyword uh, that we're searching for, we now retrieve multiple columns, uh, the columns that uh, the keyword hashes to. Uh, and it also provides compression. Um, so these, so these bloom filters are much smaller than the long bitmaps. Uh, and so that makes our search time uh, much, uh, much smaller. It also means that we don't have to commit to a fixed dictionary uh, at the beginning of time. So we just have to choose how to size our bloom filter. Um, which is based on the number of documents that we, or sorry, the number of keywords that we expect to have in a document. Uh, and so we don't have to commit to a fixed dictionary um, at, uh, uh, ahead of time. So the third challenge that I want to talk about is how we encrypt this search index. So one of the properties that we wanted is that the attacker shouldn't be able to immediately learn the contents of the search index. Uh, and so one way we could try to accomplish this is by encrypting every bit in the boom filter separately. Um, so we can't encrypt by a row because our updates are going to retrieve columns. Uh, and we can't encrypt uh, by a column because our updates are writing rows. Uh, and so encrypting each bit separately is going to cause our search index size to blow up by a factor of our security parameter. Uh, so in order to avoid this, we can generate a unique one-time pad using the document version number. And here we're going to rely on the underlying and encrypted file system to provide these document version numbers for us correctly. Uh, and ensure that we never reuse this one-time pad. Um, so we can just have the contents of our search index um, x squared with a unique pad for each document. Uh, and this is going to allow us to encrypt the search index without, uh, without any change in the size. Uh, this is important for keeping the time of our linear scan uh, fairly small. Um, so the next challenge that I want to talk about is how we defend against malicious attackers. Um, so recall that one of our requirements was that we need to defend against attackers that can influence server behavior. And so we want to assume a malicious rather than a semi-honest um, threat model. So one way we can defend against this is using message authentication codes or MACs. And so we can generate a MAC for every bit in the search index. Um, so as before, we can't generate them on a per row basis because our updates are retrieving columns. And we can't generate them on a per column basis because our updates are writing rows. Uh, so if we do this, if we have a MAC for every bit, then our search index and our search time is going to blow up by a factor of our security parameter. Um, now we'll need to retrieve the appropriate max for each of our searches, uh, and this is going to be pretty expensive for us. Um, so instead, we leverage this tool called aggregate max um, to keep a single MAC per column. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward tool from uh, Katzen Lundell. And the idea is that we're going, to uh, we're going to store a single aggregate MAC tag for each column. Uh, our updates are going to update this aggregate MAC tag uh, for each of the columns. And then when we do a search, we're going to retrieve um, the single aggregate MAC tag for each column. Uh, and this is going to allow us um, to provide integrity uh, with a much smaller uh, amount of space in our search index, um, and so at a much lower overhead in terms of search latency. So the final challenge that I want to talk about is how we provide user revocation. Uh, so one of the requirements in our survey that I didn't have, didn't have time to discuss is that we want to be able to efficiently revoke a user's access to files. Um, so in many encrypted search systems, this is, uh, this is pretty expensive. So you have to basically recompute the entire search index uh, whenever a user leaves if you want to provide security against, uh, against that user being compromised. Uh, so in encrypted file systems, uh, this can be done pretty cheaply using this concept of lazy revocation. Um, so let's say Bob's access is revoked. Um, the, uh, the users Alice and Charlie are going to choose new keys. Um, and then subsequent writes will use that new key. And subsequent reads will either use the new key or the old key, depending on when the document accessed was last updated. Uh, and so right after Bob is revoked, Bob can still go and read uh, the documents that haven't been updated uh, since his access was revoked. Um, but intuitively, this is maybe OK, since Bob already had access to that version of the documents uh, that he's still able to access. So we'd like to provide some similar notion of security for encrypted search, um, also at a fairly low cost. 
we don't want to have to uh, regenerate the search index every time uh, we change the membership. Um, so to do this, uh, we're going to leverage similar techniques. Um, so our updates can use a new key in the same way uh, that uh, lazy verification does. And now we can decrypt search results using the key corresponding to the last update. Um, and we can check the MAC tag using the key also corresponding to the last update. Um, and here we can leverage uh, the properties aggregate max. Um, these aggregate max, uh, that this aggregate max scheme can aggregate together max uh, computed not only over different messages, but also using different keys. Uh, and this is really the property that allows us um, to aggregate things together using different keys and not have to switch uh, from the old key to the new key immediately, uh, but slowly transition over time. Okay, so now I want to move on to talking a little bit about the implementation and evaluation. Um, so we implemented Jory and open sourced it uh, and passed the OSCI artifact evaluation process. Um, and we evaluate performance using the NROD ML data set. Um, we compare Dory to two baselines. Um, so first, a plain text search baseline. We just use an inverted index without any encryption. And um, we also compared it to an ORAM baseline, which is just an inverted index and path ORAM. Um, and here we had to be careful uh, with padding because we didn't want to um, leak the number. Uh, we, we didn't want to leak information about the keyword being searched for based on the number of blocks that we retrieved. Um, and some keywords are obviously going to appear uh, in more documents than others. Um, so we need to make sure that we're padding to the maximum number of blocks corresponding to a given keyword. Uh, and we'll need to, so for a search, we'll need to get all the documents corresponding to a keyword. And for an update, we'll need to perform um, an or well, well, we'll, we'll need to update the list uh, of documents corresponding to a keyword for every keyword in that document. Okay, so here we're looking at search latency for around 1,000 to around a million documents. Uh, we can see that plain text search stays pretty constant around 16 milliseconds. Um, Dory, the search latency, um, after a while starts to grow linearly. Uh, this is expected because we need a linear scan over all the documents in order to perform a search. Um, and there's a pretty substantial gap between our ORAM baseline um, and Dory. And this is really due to the fact um, that we perform um, a significant number of ORAM accesses uh, in order to pad out to the largest number of blocks associated with a keyword. Um, and so these ORM accesses become fairly expensive um, in, this, uh, in comparison to Dory in this case. Um, so Dory is also highly parallelizable. So unlike our ORM baseline, by adding more servers, we're actually able to reduce the search latency. Um, so with a single server, uh, Dory takes around three seconds to search over a million documents. Um, but as we increase the number of servers, uh, we're actually able to reduce the latency to under a millisecond, or sorry, under, <laughs> under one second. Um, so we can see that um, going from one to two servers um, reduces it to a, uh, just under two seconds, um, and then reducing, uh, and then using four servers, you're able to reduce it to under one second. Um, and so finally, I want to show throughput. Um, so here we can see that as before, the plain text search um, throughput stays relatively constant, just like in latency. Um, the Dory throughput starts to uh, drop linearly, as expected since our search time um, is also um, requ uh, requires this linear scan over all the entire search index. Um, and th there's a substantial gap between the Dory throughput and the ORAN baseline throughput. Uh, and this is really due to the overhead of these updates. Um, so we need to uh, perform ORAN accesses for every keyword um, in the document in order to perform um, an update. And so this becomes uh, pretty expensive in comparison to uh, the difference between Dory and ORAM uh, when we consider search latency. Uh, so in conclusion, Dory is an efficient search system that hides search access patterns. And by re-examining the system model, we're able to reconcile the tension between efficiency and search access patterns. Uh, and we show that search should not be a barrier to the adoption of end encrypted systems. Uh, Thank you, and I'll take any questions. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Hi, Matt. Yeah, thanks a lot for your great presentation. I just have a quick question. Uh, 
Uh, this is Tang. Uh, 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 so I, th I see that Dory can be able to hide the search button uh, using the distributed point function, but do you also consider hiding the updating button? Like when you want to update the same file over the time? So do you consider that one too? Yeah, 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 yeah. that's a great question. So we're really considering layering Dory on top of these end encrypted file systems. Um, and these end encrypted file systems are already leaking which, uh, which documents are being updated, so we don't hide that. Um, we talk about in our paper how you can make Dory uh, compatible with, uh, with an oblivious file system that does hide this information. Uh, this, this would require some, some additional overhead. Uh, and, the, and one of the reasons Dory's throughput is pretty good, especially in comparison to the ORM baseline, is because these updates are so cheap. Um, so we don't hide this information. Uh, we talk a little bit about how you could do it. Um, but it, it's really, yeah, we don't, we, don't, we don't hide this because we're really interested in targeting these and unencrypted file systems for this information that's already being leaked. All right. Good question. Great. Right. Yeah. Thanks. So I, I guess like the, the server time is linear in the final scheme. Yes, yes. Uh -huh. So, I mean, it's interesting to see like at, um, like when the database is really large, like linear is not going to scale very well. Right? Yes, 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 exactly. So we're, so we're, we're, we're really targeting these workloads that, that we got from the survey from these unencrypted file system companies. Um, where they're really considering the documents that the average, like, like the average number of documents that a user has access to, um, where the upper bound is really a million, we're really looking more around 50,000 documents. Um, so in that case, maybe a linear scan is okay. Uh, but, you, but you're completely right that if you end up with like, uh, you know, a much larger set of documents, uh, if you're considering a different application, um, a, a linear scan is not going to be the ideal solution. Yeah, it's really it's really just sort of based yeah just just based on the survey and the expected workloads um, that that, uh, that that we're considering based on our results. Okay, so uh, if there's no other question, let's thank Emma again. Thanks, Liz. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank great. you. Yeah, thank you. Thank for you. Coming.